Thank you. So, um, <laughs> needless to say, thank you. I mean, there's a whole litany of things you're supposed to say in moments like this. Thank you, Joni. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everybody I know. So thank you. We'll just move on. But just please know that I could stand here and say nothing but thank you. And we you know, literally would fill the time. Or the number of people here that I see my friends, and you know, I could call Jeff and Jim out by name, or Dan and David and Sheila, and I, I, Joni, I, I could call a Alex and Linda. I could do that a lot here. And, and, and uh, so we, I could use the whole 45 minutes saying thank you. And I, I won't, because you didn't come for that. And you, if you know me, and even if you don't, I hope you will know this about me, that I am a thankful person. So if I don't say it enough tonight, you know me. You know what you mean to me. Um, writing is best done by lonely people. <laughs> <laughs> because you're going to be alone, so you best kind of be inured to it. And it's groups like you and the friends like you, and it's the faces and people that I know here that help offset that. I go uh, long, long, long periods of days and, 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 and certainly each day and, and, and days without seeing a person. And sometimes I talk to somebody on the phone, but it's true, you do live in two worlds. You do live in two worlds. I, 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 you can pick up any one of my 15 novels right now, read a sentence and I will tell you the next sentence or I will paraphrase it pretty damn closely. And that's the kind of head you end up getting because in all that, by the way, is fictional. <laughs> so, so the amount of bandwidth that you're left over to handle this <laughs> is not so easy. And, 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 I, and it makes people like me sort of asocial and, and a little awkward um, and, and, uh, and a little lonely. So, so I, do, I do thrill to see people in the house that I, I frankly know love me. I mean, you know I love you, but it's such a coin toss if you love me back. And I, 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 I know that people in this house love me. And so that was embarrassing. Uh, Did you get a little brick limp A little bit of uh, Yiddish sherry for the full moment. For, for the moment. Uh, I'd like to call out a special group of people that are more than friends to me. They are veterans of our American Armed Services. Um, a great many of you are here because I've known you through the Mighty Pen Project, a program that I, uh, I'm very proud and fortunate to say that I started with the Virginia War Memorial, and I've met some of the finest people. Um, yes, they served in, in, in uniform, and yes, they served honorably, um, but they are also amazingly fine people, independent of that relationship. And I, if you are a Mighty Pen writer, would you please stand and let me give you a round of applause, please. Eric, on your feet, Jack. And I, I would also like to say my, uh, when I die, when I die, uh, many of you will see spirit animals. You will have a, I don't know, an elk, some elegant thing with antlers, and, or a, a condor with great spread wings, and, you will see bears and, and lions and the spirit animals you have, and I will see David Aldrich. <laughs> um, so, and also, uh, um, uh, obviously, Joni Albrecht is, is, um, is a special person to me and, and independent. If I had never been born, would not have been one less with special. So, um, thank you, Joni. For, um, so, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read a chapter. Now, there are two choices, and I'm going to let you pick. Now, typically, people read the first several scenes, and mine are good, they're good, they're good, they're like them. But then there's another set of scenes, so there's three characters. Actually, I'll talk about the book first. I jumped in. So what did I do, or what did I do? It has been, as a Jew, I grew up with all the mythos of the Old Testament. They're great stories. They're, they're probably the best stories. I mean, they're great stories. Um, but they pale before the adventure of the creation of the state of Israel. They pale. Abraham, Moses, all of them pale. Walking across the Sinai, the, the, the tablets up and down the hill, throwing them, pick them up, come get another set. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it all pales. 
before the raw adventure. Now, I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about relations between Palestinian and Jew. I'm not. I'm just talking about the adventure of creating a state, of surviving Europe, and creating a state. And, and, and the question that gets asked most um, is, is about peace, right? It's always about how will there be peace? And I want to begin a movement here tonight that I want you to spread, and because it's what I'm writing about. And, 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 and Joni mentioned the character Malik, Malik and Mrs. Papel. Malik is a Bedouin, uh, um, and Mrs. Papel is a, is a Jew, and they fall in love in the book. And I'm actually working on the sequel, and in the sequel they, they stay together. And they represent what I think is the answer to the Middle East, and that is reconciliation. <clears throat> I, I believe that what we've seen in South Africa, between de Klerk and Mandela, between the ANC and, and, uh, and the government in South Africa, I think that's the only recipe that can happen. If there was going to be a military solution, it would happen by now. The Palestinians are owed for the 20th century. They are. So if there's going to be a military solution, it would have happened. If there's going to be a political solution, it would have happened. Um, the greatest minds of their political minds of the generations are Metternichs, are, are, are Napoleons, are uh, the greatest minds have taken this issue on. They come up flat tired, they can't pull it off. And that's because they think the solution is political. They think the solution is give and take. Or, and, and, and they think the solution is, is, is killing. They think it's killing. <laughs> so I think it's reconciliation. I think it's forgiveness. And I know it seems weak, and I'm a big strap and strong guy, muscles and all that, but I can tell you, <clears throat> there's nothing, there's nothing like forgiveness. It just isn't. I'm not here to preach. This is, that's not what this is about. I'm talking about as a political tool. We've seen it, we've seen it. The, 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 the enmity between the South Africans and the black South Africans and the white South Africans, while the situations are not analogs, I'm not trying to compare the, the, the occupation of the, of the West Bank with the apartheid of the white South Africans, this is not what I'm doing. I'm only talking about the hatreds that flow back and forth in a free Congress, right? Those were significant. Those were not, those, they seemed an impregnable bastion. It seemed no one could break that. And then Nelson Mandela, Spent his 29 years in Robben Island, and Bill McClurk said, holy smokes, <laughs> if that guy can come out of 29 years and still come to me and say, hey, look, can we work something out? I'm sorry. Bill McClurk had very little choice except to stick his hand back out and say, well, uh, I'm sorry. And boom, boom, state of South Africa was reborn through forgiveness. And do not see a path forward for Israel and the Palestinians without forgiveness. Because the Jews are not going to lose a military confrontation with any nation on this planet, I might add. And the Palestinians are not going to be able to mount any significant military confrontation. The Jews are going to notice. They just crush it and look bad in the process of doing it, right? At the same time, the Palestinian misery is so palpable, so moving, and so long-standing. And as I said yesterday, for those of you who heard me in the podcast with the JCC, I am trying to learn to see the need and not the person with the need. I am trying myself to learn that if I see children on the border, I don't get into politics of who put them there, who takes them out. I, I, I get into children who are without their parents, right? And then I'll worry whether they're Honduran or Mexican or Texan later. And when I look at the Palestinian people in the West Bank and in the Gaza, I see hunger. I see oppression. I see uh, all the calling cards of, 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 of an oppressed people, and, and, and I try not to see them as political beings, but to see misery. And it is hard. It is hard. <laughs> it's almost, un and, and it's a Gordian knot. You can't undo this when you put political needs of the state of Israel against the misery of the state of, 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 of the, 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 the human state versus the political state, they weigh the same. Israel's a magnificent accomplishment. Don't get me wrong, it's a magnificent accomplishment. And a needed thing, the Jewish people must have a home there. But the Palestinian people are suffering, and it's really hard, really hard to see suffering and say, yeah, well, suck it up, <laughs> right? Because I need the state of Israel. So I, I, I can't 
That's why this baffles the greatest minds in the tribe, because they weigh the same. They weigh the same. So you can't go in and say, well, my state takes precedence over your misery. You're like, well, fine, try being miserable. Yeah, right. Go be miserable for 10 minutes and come back and talk to me about your state of Israel. And if they're right, both sides are right. And so that's why I want you to read this book. And I want you to consider, and then in a year and a half or whatever, read the next one. Because um, <laughs> the book really is this big, I just cut it in half. You're reading the first half. Um, but but I, I want to be, I want this book to be, and I want to be a spokesman of a beginning of a movement to, to cons have the people of Israel and the Palestinian states consider saying they're sorry to each other. And 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 because we've seen it work. One time, one time we've seen it work. And that was Bill and the clerk and Nelson Mandela. And so we know it can work. Anyway, uh, that's what I tried to do. <laughs> I don't know if I did. Harry <laughs> says I did, but but that's what I tried to write. So um, so the book starts in 1945. Well, no, it starts in 1940 when Rivka, who, who was named Eva at the time, because a lot of Jews changed their names when they reached Palestine. So you will hear her as Eva. So these are the two choices. I can read you the first section when Eva leaves Vienna, gets on a boat, and sees for the first time Palestine across the Mediterranean, that, that passage on the boat. Or my brother David Aldrich there is particularly fond of um, so later chapters, there are three characters. There's Rivka. All right, I'm leaving again. I know what you want you to see. So the, my, my structure for the book is there's three principal characters. There are, and I think there are three, we can call them miracles, we can call them accomplishments. Um, three, stool, three legs of the stool of Israel. I say that the first is the agricultural. Any of us who've been to Israel, they're like, you turned this into a Olive grove, that? It's impossible. It's impossible. The amount of work to desalinate, move those stuff, amazing achievement. So the first thing is the agricultural accomplishment. The second is the military. I'm sorry, but about 700,000 people beat the population, the joint population of about 140 million Arabs. It's impossible. It's impossible to, to, for Ben Gurion to step up to a podium and go, oh, yo, we're Israel now, and then literally five hours later be invaded by the tanks of five Arab nations. Hours later, not even the next day, that day, as the sun set, the tanks of five Arab nations coursed across the Israeli frontier, and they won that war. Well, that's a miracle. I don't care who did that. I don't care if that's Hannibal or Napoleon or Schwarzkopf. I don't care. That's a miracle. So there's the agriculture miracle, the military miracle, and the diplomatic miracle. The diplomatic miracle that, that people like Ben-Gurion and, and before him, Herzl and on and on, that they were able to convince the world that the Jewish people, even before the Holocaust, should have a whole land, right? Now let me just opine on that for a second, then I will leave. All questions begin with this question. Should there be a Jewish homeland? If you decide there should not be, well, there's a set of questions that you ask. If you decide there should be, well, then this set gets answered and you ask a different set. So let me presume with you that there should be a Jewish homeland, and I'll tell you why. Those of you who are not Jewish, have read about the Jewish people having their asses kicked over millennia, chased from corner to corner, from globe to, I mean, chased around the world. And, and, and the question is, what did we do? <laughs> what, who's, who's potted plant did we piss in? I mean, what, what, <laughs> what did we do? And the answer is, we did nothing. The answer is, we did nothing to Rome, we did nothing to the Ottomans, we did nothing to the Germans, we did nothing to nobody. What did we do? The answer was, we did nothing. But, Name one people on the planet who didn't have a homeland. You screw with a Frenchman, you gotta deal with the Gaul. <laughs> right? You screw with a German, you gotta deal with, well, Germans. <laughs> <laughs> you screw with an American, you gotta deal with Donald Trump. <laughs> who wants that aggravation, right? And, and 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 but you know, you screw with anybody, you screw with a Pole, you screw with an Italian, you screw with someone from China. You screw with someone from Russia, Ukraine. Well, these are all countries. They have that in common. So I'll stop naming them. But the point is, you screw with anybody on the planet, they got a passport, right? They got somebody behind them. They got Big Brother behind them. There was one people in the world that lacked a homeland. So you could screw with them all you wanted. And no one was coming to knock on your door. You could be the Pope. No one's going to knock on your door. You could be Napoleon. No one's going to knock on your door. You could be Hitler. No one's going to knock on your door. 
The Jews have to have a homeland, if for no other reason than to stop getting screwed with. <laughs> right? Because for millennia, for millennia, there's strangers in every land they lived in. Strangers in every land they lived in. So you could screw with the Jews, and there was no one to come protect them. And they had no passport that said Jew land. Right? The Frenchman does. Italian does. Pole does. Someone from freaking Iceland does. <laughs> but a Jew did not. And so we've been the mark for every empire because there was no homeland. And that is the only political statement I will make. That's my own personal political statement. That's the only one I will make because my heart breaks for both sides, as you can tell. Um, so I'm going to let you choose. Should I read the first couple pages where Rivka first sees Palestine? It's quite lovely. <laughs> or my brother David Aldrich likes um, the sweet character. It says Rivka, the, Rivka's a kibbutz, kibbutznik. She lives on a, uh, the, the name of the book, if you haven't seen one, <laughs> they're everywhere, um, is Isaac Beacon. The Isaac Beacon is the anglicized version of Maswat Yitzchak. Maswat Yitzchak is one of four kibbutzim in a, in a small kibbutz block uh, south of Jerusalem called Gush Etzion. Gush Etzion was the site of a very famous massacre that was a reprisal for what the Jews did to the Arabs in a very famous place called Deir Yassin. Those two events are covered in this book. I know I keep threatening to start reading, but I have yet another thing to tell you. So, <laughs> I bought a new car two years, three years ago. And I sat down with the, the dealership finance guy. And he was Palestinian, he's from Hebron. I said, oh, I've been to Hebron? I don't talk about his hometown. And I said, so to repeat, so here's Jerusalem, right? And there's a road into Jerusalem, and the Arabs has interdicted that road. So the Jews said we have to open the road to Jerusalem. We can't allow Jerusalem to be throttled. So they said we have to we have to cauterize and, and capture and do what we have to all the Arab villages on either side of this road leading into Jerusalem. Well, that was being done by the Haganah, which was the state of Israel's, you know. In army of sorts. Well, the, the, the issue of the Jewish Palestine, the people, they had their own kind of underground army called the Haganah. Well, there was also two other paramilitary groups called the Lehi, which we know as the Stern Gang, and the Irgun. The Irgun was being run by Menachem Begin. I know he's a terrorist, but one of my favorite politicians of all time. <laughs> and so Begin says to Ben Gurion, hey, whoa, 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 we want a piece of the action, right? You're not going to win this war all by yourself, Ben Gurion. You know, I mean, come on, when it's over, you're going to be at the table, so we want one of these villages. Give us one to conquer. And Ben Gurion said, oh, well, take that one. And the one he said was Dir Yassin, which is right outside Jerusalem on the heights on what's called the Bab al-Wad, which is a ravine more than you need to know. Anyway, village, Dir Yassin. So now while the Haganah is conquering all these other villages, this is all in the book. The Irgun and the Lehi, which again, we'll just call Stern Gang. The Irgun and the Stern Gang are not trained soldiers. They're not Holly. They're not David. They're not, they're not Phil. They're not John. They're not Dave. They're not trained. These are assassins. These are people that blow up bridges and blow up trucks and, and, and shoot, you know, Bernadotte and, and Lord Main. You know, <laughs> these are assassins. So they went into Darius Sin. And they acted like assassins. They killed about 100 150 civilians. Just killed them because they were trained, weren't trained not to. And two weeks later, the Palestinians took over Masawa Yitzhak, this place, and they machine gunned 250 Jews. And so I'm telling you at the end of the book, but you won't remember, but, but, <laughs> but the book cascades towards these two events. Right. So you will see the radicalization of Hugo, who wakes up in Buchenwald. He wakes up hours before he's going to die. You look like you've been reading the book. Good day, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can stand up and speak when I'm done. <laughs> um, but but uh, Hugo wakes up in Buchenwald, and we meet, we meet him when he wakes up. He's hours from just dying, just being done. It's May 8th. The war's over. The Allies are, are, are uh, liberating Buchenwald. And he wakes up, and we follow this tiny little bag of sticks in a, in a cloth outfit. We follow him all the way to where he becomes an Agudist and his radicalization. That's kind of his arc. We meet Rivka in, in the first chapters, a 16-year-old girl leaving her family 
behind an Austria saying, you must follow me. You must, you cannot stay here. And the father's a very proud man. He said, well, you're saying I can't protect you? She's like, no, you can't. Not from the Germans. And he says one of the most faithful lines. He says, there's 250,000 Jews in Vienna. What can we do? Well, we know. So, um, so that's Rivka. And then there's Vince Haas. And Vince is based on two real reporters. You might remember I.F. Stone, who traveled with the Jews from, uh, from, from France all the way to, to Palestine on an illegal ship. And a guy named uh, Bilby, who wrote a beautiful book called uh, uh, Rising Star of the New e the New Star of the Near East. And they're both uh, Herald Tribune reporters. So Vince is an amalgam of them. He's a reporter. And reporters are great characters for those of you who are writers, because you can put them wherever you want. I know your assignment is here, because shit's happening here. I need you here, right? <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so those are the three characters. And so um, I can read you. I got a question for you before I start. <laughs> What the heck? I, so, question. And if you know the answer, don't raise your hand because I don't want I want the wrong answers. So, how many Jews from May 1945, the end of the war, made it to Israel by May of 1948 over those three years? Once Israel established itself, and remember now Israel was 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 being handled by the British. It was the British mandate, right? The, the League of Nations had given them the mandate to run. Palestine. So there was no state of Israel until May 1948. So from 1945 when the war ends to 1948, how many Jews made it from Europe to Israel? Anyone know? Throw a guess out. Don't leave me alone. Three million. Three million. Four million. Four million. 160,000. 160,000. Anyone else? 80,000. 80,000. 100,000. 100,000. 11,000. 11,000. 11,000 Jews made it from the camps to Israel in three years. And that's because the British would not allow them in. We all know the story of Exodus. It was one of about 300 ships that a, that a, that a Haganah group called the Aliyah Bet tried to get into Israel, tried to get them in, and they couldn't. The British interdicted all of them. 11,000 Jews made it into Palestine in three years. And that's what the book is about. Um, so I can read you when Hugo wakes up in the camp, um, and it's quite powerful, I know David likes it, or I can read you the opening pages um, of when we first meet Rivka and we we begin the book. Anybody? Opening pages. Opening pages. Yeah. Holly, you've read both. I've read Hugo. I've read it. Hugo. Do you like Hugo? Hugo. 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 Okay. Hold across here it comes. <laughs> um, I have to get behind the podium now. To not want to go. Can you see me now? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let me find Hugo. And it's been All right. Is this thing right up there? No. Oh no, thank you. Is that good? No, I'm fine. Am I making I make everything look like doll furniture. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. If you've ever invited me to your house, I would sit in your furniture and I look like I should be drinking little cups of invisible tea. We're <laughs> little pretend friends. I make everybody's furniture look so small. If I don't break it, if I don't break it, I'm banned from sitting in some people's chairs. It just we have a bench, you sit on that <laughs> That's not a joke, that's actually true. <laughs> Alright, Hugo, chapter eight, for those of you reading in your hymnals. <laughs> Um, by the way, if there's a line you really like, stop me and say so. <laughs> Love that, David. I like interaction. What page are you on? Um, uh, page 67. How great right. that was. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 8, Hugo, April 12th. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea I was that gifted. <laughs> On a pallet with no cushion, in a body with no fat, Hugo slept well. Everyone in the barrack did it the first nights and years, but they were certain they would not be murdered the next day. No, no, that's wrong. That's too soon. He's not even saved. <laughs> ah, I take it back. I am on page 57. Uh -oh. <laughs> Chapter 7. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the only one in the whole book. 
Don't be ready to do it. All right, chapter 7, Hugo, April 11th, Buchenwald. <laughs> Hugo awoke. He did not know why. When he closed his eyes, he believed it would be for the last time. His strength had ebbed. He lay behind his eyelids, trapped with his pulse, listening to a tap like a prisoner in a cell. He slept, or did he faint? He had no idea how long he'd been on his pallet. What use was time when it measured only the living? Then his eyes opened. He sensed first his aloneness. Licking unwatered lips, Hugo gazed up into the gray slats of the pallet above him. No one moved there, no one crowded him, left or right. His shaved head lay on the pillow of his upturned food pot. He cast his hearing out into the barracks. Only a creak returned, a scratch, perhaps a rat leaping between rafters. Or maybe the big room was full, thirty to a pallet, and all the coughing, twitching, and doomed men were blocked out because he lacked the life to hear them. Hugo's fingers traced the hem of his prisoner's coat, the spike of his emaciated hip, the corduroy of his ribs. These touches restored an awareness of himself, the things he'd lost. Hugo sniffed. The smoke was there. The ovens still blazed. He would take this stench to his death no matter when it arrived. He pivoted on his hard skull, left and right. No one else occupied the bunks. Far away, as though at the long end of a telescope, the sun glowed in the open door, golden today. A rumble swelled until it trembled the walls. Voices climbed in volume and excitement. These were not at all like the sounds of Hugo's time in the camps, when only exhaust and grief and ovens had voices. Outside, men cried welcome. Da, da, da. Hands fluttered around him like pigeons. Pearly teeth gave off the scent of tobacco. One hand held him upright on the pallet, another rested on his shoulder, a third on his gaunt calf. A fourth man dashed away. A fleshy soldier talked loudly, close to his face as though Hugo were deaf as well as starving. The soldier said, American, similar enough to Americana, for Hugo to understand who they were. For some reason, they put Hugo on his feet. Two soldiers supported him, urged him to walk. Hugo tried, though he was confounded as to why he ought to. He managed one good step in his canvas shoes, then his lagging leg buckled. Another American, a lanky one, caught him before he could collapse. The man cradled Hugo like a child to carry him out through the door. The sudden sun was a shock to Hugo's eyes. Sitting on the ground in the glaring light, he was forced to look at himself. His hands were bundles of sticks, wrists and ankles, the joints of a skeleton. The pitying looks of the Americans showed him to be an unforgiving sight. Hugo marveled at the resilience of life, even his own. How hard it must be to snuff that it could live on inside him like this. He sat in a circle of soldiers, some standing, some kneeling. To a man, they were decked in metal, their weapons, grenades, canteens, knives, helmets, bullets, <clears throat> wedding rings, buckles. Hugo wore nothing but skin and tattered cloth. The soldiers spoke to him and to each other, but their voices were like birdsong, distant and meaningless. I love that line, birdsong, distant and meaningless, just... <laughs> <laughs> Too weary to lift his eyes, Hugo studied the world at his level. American soldiers strode everywhere, pants tucked inside muddy boots. The prisoners of Buchenwald dragged along in their striped garb on ragged shoes. Some ran, but even their running seemed hobbled next to the long strides of the soldiers. A great tank idled beside Hugo's barracks, the thunder which had shaken his walls. All well and good, the Americans had come. Prayers had been answered. The stink of the smoke was stronger out here than it was inside the barrack. The Americans seemed very intent on their amazement in the camp. Hugo didn't want this hunger that made him a pile of bones on the ground, didn't want to die. This was all he could muster, what he didn't want. Too weak to recall anything more, even, even with Americans running about all of a sudden. Minutes ago, he lay on the brink and was done resisting. Hugo had seen a hundred thousand go to their deaths up the chimney. His turn had come, one more. He tried to lie back to see if he might continue dying he could do it in the sun just as well. Honey, get <laughs> <laughs>
It's okay. It would have to be you, wouldn't it, Alex? <laughs> Alex Feisch is the one whose phone just rang. Yeah. Alex Feisch, the one person sitting closest to me. <laughs> 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 I'm reading about the Holocaust, man. Could you just. <laughs> I, I just can't, okay? I can't. <laughs> He, I'm gonna back up. He tried to lie back to see if he might continue dying. He could do it in the sun just as well. Before his spine could touch the dirt, hands raised him upright. Hugo wasn't annoyed or relieved. If not yesterday or now, death would come tomorrow or on its own day. That was Buchenwald. Easy, friend, easy. Others in the ring of soldiers retreated. The man on his knees seemed to have taken control. He had a fair complexion face and blue eyes. He smelled as dirty as the rest. He wore a pea armband. You're gonna be all right, just, just stay with me. No more dying today, friend. The soldiers spoke German. Nazis, Hugo's hands came up on their own, recoiling. The Nazis had left the camp. Now one was among the Americans. Nine, nine, nine! Hugo pushed at him. The soldier did nothing to fend off Hugo, but endured the pushes, small things. Even with Hugo's useless mitts on him, the German speaker said crisply, I'm going to get you a medic. Stay calm. It's over, friend. We're here now. The soldier yelled in English into the crowd of inmates and soldiers past the growling tank. He waved at one soldier who changed directions and hustled over. Hugo dropped his resistance and sat, sun-warmed. He didn't know his fate, swerving as it was between living and dying. The short panic had shifted him toward life for a moment. He lingered to see what life held. Death was busy with the chimney, it would bide its time and wait for him. Hugo whispered, marshalling all the voice he could. The soldier leaned closer. A yellow pencil was tucked behind the man's ear. This, by the way, is Vince. See him. He carried no rifle, no grenades, or bandoliers, only a sidearm. His waistcoat was blank without insignia or patches. He was long limbed, scrunched to the side, Hugo. Hugo rasped, Why? Do you speak German? My family's German. I, I grew up speaking it. The beckoned soldier arrived. A red cross on his helmet showed him to be medical. He held a canteen to Hugo's mouth for one sweet swallow. A handful of pills came out of a bag with a tin of milk. The German speaker said the pills were vitamins. When a passing American offered a chocolate bar, the medical man pushed it away, then had his words translated. Don't eat anything these men offer you. No rations, no candy, your stomach won't tolerate it. Tell somebody to get you soup, fluids. We're bringing up a hospital in a field kitchen. Finish the milk, hang in there. You're gonna make it. Hugo needed help to tip the condensed milk to his lips. Emptying the can bloated his gut. He belched, a pain that made him clutch his chest. The thin soldier rubbed his back, making Hugo conscious of his own knobby spine. The Americans around him, the ones who lifted him into the sunny yard, faded into the hurly-burly of the liberation. The medical man jogged off to other cries. More vehicles roared into the camp and urgency charged the legs, churning past Hugo on the ground. The soldier remained kneeling at his side. Hugo didn't ask why, slightly miffed that the other soldiers had wandered off. He was pitiable and deserved some attention. Wasn't he dying? Apparently not. Hugo asked the German speaker's name. Vincent's Hatz. The milk had loosened Hugo's throat <clears throat> enough to where his voice began to resemble his own. I hear the pencil behind your ear. Vincent's Haas grinned, pleased with Hugo's curiosity. I'm a reporter. He tapped the armband. Press. Lift me off the ground. I feel like an abandoned pet. <laughs> Once Hugo was put on his unsteady feet, tall Haas had to stoop to support him. They found a chair against the wall in the sunlight. Camp cards had sat in this chair. Haas walked off, leaving him alone again. Hugo drew a breath that he sampled in his lungs, as though deciding whether to take another. <laughs> Life had returned with the milk of the Americans. Healthy prisoners walked past in their stripes, jubilant, and they, too, ignored Hugo. A thousand starved men and women like him stumbled around, many shirtless and without shame, to show the Americans what had been done to them. Buchenwald's production shacks and barracks, stucco barns, and a black watchtower. 
furnace building, and command offices all were emptied of their guardians. The Nazis had deserted the camp days ago and taken 20,000 Jews with them, surely to eliminate them. The afternoon sun peaked. The day was aging, but the world was new. The notion of death returned to Hugo. His life had been rekindled, but only barely. He rested his hand against the wall and stared blankly ahead as if he knew the path death would take. Hugo sat in plain sight, brightly lit. No one addressed him. He might as just as well been a ghost. He could believe he was dead. Some small comfort crept alongside that. There was company in death. And life was going to be like this a can of milk, a Nazi's chair, a little else. Hugo didn't see the reporter until he strode out of the river of soldiers and prisoners. Haas carried a second chair straight for Hugo. High above, the chimney breathed no more. Near the main gate, under the clock tower, and the iron sign that declared, Jedem das Zene, to each as he deserves, inmates hoisted two Americans onto their shoulders. Haas placed his chair next to Hugo. He held out a lukewarm tin cup. Hugo held the aroma of coffee to his nose a long time before drinking. Um, I'm going to read you one and a half more pages. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. You speak of everybody now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Boy>. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Vincennes Haas asked to be called Vince, the American version of his name. This struck Hugo well. The man's embrace of America it spoke of change. Hugo expected to be interviewed, but the reporter didn't take the pencil from behind his ear. Vince propped his elbows on his long legs and asked not about Hugo's time in the camps, but his life before. This seemed a way to get Hugo talking, to ask first about his life before he became a victim, before he became the same as millions. You'll understand, Hugo said, if I'm slow to talk about my past. Vince Haas said he would go first. He was 35, three years younger than Hugo. His family had left Munich in 1927 when he was 17, landing in New York. Vince did a youthful turn in the Marine Corps, served two years in Cuba at a base where he did guard duty and sunbathed. <laughs> After the Marines, he went home to New York where he took a college degree in journalism, then a big job at a big newspaper, the Herald Tribune. He worked his way up from night court to crime to sports and local politics. With a chance, Rose to cover the last months of the war in Europe, he grabbed it. A step up from covering the city desk, Vince flew to Paris, hooked a ride out on a truck for France, crossed the Rhine, and caught up with the U.S. Third Army just in time. Hugo asked, just in time? For what? He was aware of how he must look, eyes sunk in gray sockets, camp eyes. This? <laughs> the American tossed away a cigarette to gaze beyond the wire to the easy hills, brilliant in spring light. Train track cut through the rolling Weimar forest to a platform, then to a road that entered the gates of Buchenwald. That was where Vince's understanding must stop at the gates. He could go, he could not go further on into the filthy barracks that held 30,000 where there was room for 5,000, or into the workhouses, into the ovens for those who collapsed or were chosen, to the labs for experiments, then up the chimney. Vince, the reporter, had hurried here in time for this because he could not imagine it from America. Vince linked his fingers. He spit into the dirt through the ring of his arms. Hugo finished the coffee and tossed away the cup. He wanted a beer, the first one he thought of in a long time, though he knew a beer might kill him. <laughs> Hugo ran his fingers, then thin his tinder over his own scalp. So your parents spirited their boy out of Germany before the Nazis could get him. The American reporter did not lift his gaze out of the circle made by his arms, elbows on bony knees, and his long joined hands. Nazis wouldn't have gotten me. No. Hugo lay a hand, finger, uh, fingers thin as tinder on Vince's arm. We have no idea, none of us, what they're capable of. Vince focused somewhere unnaturally on his spit in Buchenwald's dirt. Hugo said, help me with my feet. Vince lifted him by one arm. Hugo wavered, but before the American could write him, he steadied himself. You told me your story. Now you believe I should tell you mine, I suppose. If you want to 
know something, ask. I'll tell you if I care to. I'm not a child to be tricked or traded with. All right. I think I can walk a bit. Follow me. Now, here's the problem. The really grim stuff in this chapter is next. I can stop where I've stopped, but seeing the camp through Hugo's eyes, he takes Vince on a little tour. It will take me another five minutes to read it. Joni shaking her head no. I follow Joni. Did you say no? Leave it? I would say yes. He says yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Why not? Your nose? No. Uh, five, 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 five. What's five minutes? All right. As long, look, I'm just going to say, as long as you buy books, if I'm threatening that, I will stop. All right. I'm going to jump in because, because honestly, this is this is some of my favorite writing, which is next, and and thank you for indulging me. Maybe you can yell at me later, or now if you'd like. Enjoy it. All right. I'll go quick. The Americans covered their nostrils with sleeves and kerchiefs. The smell seemed to trouble them more than the sight. None of the inmates who guided the soldiers here disrespected the dead like this. Hugo pushed closer into the stench so Vince would have to come with him. Vince screwed up his face, but did not cover his nose. None of the observers, none of the observers stayed long. They got their fill and turned away. The pile extended 40 meters down the hill. Every corpse was naked and face up, stacked as neatly as could be done. The bottom row lay oriented north-south, the next east-west, and so on, in six layers. The 800 star bodies had been stripped of belongings and identification. Their clothes had been cleaned, stored, then given to German citizens who'd suffered in the bombings. The collection and cleaning detail had been Hugo's work. A haunted face in the growing crowd was a man who'd done this with him. Vince would not walk off until Hugo did. Hugo had no intention of being cruel. He turned away slowly, not to unbalance himself. The distance to the furnaces was short as it needed to be. The stink faded enough for Vince to take a fuller breath. He was a reporter, but knew well enough to leave his pencil untouched. Barn doors stood open at opposite ends of the two-story furnace building. The brick structure had nothing striking about it, a bland face. A chimney climbed high out of its midsection, but someone had shut the fires down. At the entrance, Vince stopped walking. He clamped his lips, visibly closing something inside. He breathed fast, grasping to stop himself from what? Throwing up, screaming, tears. He walked in before Hugo. Vince reached for his pencil and slipped a notebook out of his jacket. <clears throat> he did not write, but sketched. Hugo followed, the first time he'd come inside the furnace building without pushing a wheelbarrow. The brick wall rose two stories high, 30 iron doors, a meter wide and tall, studded it. The tops of the openings were arched in decorative brickwork like a bakery. A few doors stood open, the metal trays had been pulled out by the curious. Ash heaps covered all the platters, save one where a burnt corpse lay. The fire had exposed the skull, ribs, and arm bones, melted away all hair, boiled out the blood. No other colors hinted that this mound had ever been more than black and white. The ovens could handle a hundred bodies an hour, even so, the Nazis couldn't keep pace. Then scratched rough images. Hugo left him and walked to the wall to flatten the palm against the bricks. Warmth lingered in them. Pressing his spindly hand to the bricks, he dammed the wall. If he could push this place down, he would willingly die under it. Here was where he'd been intended to die. He did push, despising his futility. Hugo came close to exhausting himself, and when he turned, he was foggy. Vince was gone outside, smoking in the sun. Other touring soldiers entered the barn doors with their prison guides. As Hugo left the crematorium, a spring gust drifted past, a whirl of ash twirled off a tray to filter over him. Hugo's canvas soles dragged on the floor of all the noises in Buchenwald, the shouts and wails, vehicles and whispers, the shuffle of his own feet struck him loudest, an almost weightless tread. Hi, Tommy. Vince didn't turn when Hugo approached. He ground a cigarette under his heel. The American couldn't lift his eyes. 
Hugo stepped close into his gaze. Vince had shed no tears. Good. His sketches would be more of use. I'm afraid you're out of luck. A cluster of inmate boys walked past, vigorous and looking for some advantage, something more than food, perhaps vengeance. Vince watched them go, and this seemed to animate him to answer. How so? I, I have no story for you. What do you mean? Well, the story must have a character. The character must have a past. Hugo pointed at the boys walking away. See them. See all of us, everyone, tens of thousands. We were all different before the Nazis. We had stories, the kind you want to know. Families and homes. Now there are no families, no homes, no work, no friends, no secrets. Every one of us has blurted out everything. All of it was thrown into a bonfire. The Nazis lit our lives, the things that made us individuals. Everything is in ashes now, indistinguishable. Well, identical, reduced to one new and, and, and terrible thing. None of us has a past, just our own portion of the powder. There's nothing you can sift out. Vince was likely the tallest man in the camp. When he looked beyond Hugo, he seemed able to see a great distance. He may have been a very good reporter. Hugo rubbed his palms together. He patted Vince's jacket, a drunken sort of gesture. I need the list. He would head back to his pallet. Meet me here tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> historians and novelists and their differences by being digested. Would you repeat that, please? Well, it's a Thucydides line that stories happen to storytellers. <laughs> and and um, what I get to do is, is, so, okay, here's what you don't have to do. You don't have to go to that terrible place. I went. You don't have to go to Israel. I went. You don't have to read 35 books. I read them. You don't have to read the memoirs of people who lived and died and killed and, and were killed. I read them. You, I, Historical fiction is an old saying that says, if you want to know history, read a history book. If you want to understand history, read historical fiction. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and um, what I get to do is I get to fill in the blanks. So history says Vince had a meeting. History says that uh, Moshe Diane had a meeting with Ben Gurion. I get to provide the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't change the, the, the events, but I get to connect the dots. History just says this happened, this happened, but I get to put somebody in the tank. I get to put somebody in the camp. I get to put somebody in the, in the ravine, you know? And so the, 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 it's the same thing, by the way, uh, when you read this book, and please do, um, when you read this book, everything is true. Literally, everything is true. There's not a single event in here that was not done by a real person, even in the small moments. Even in the smallest moments when you go, no way. Yeah, there's a record of that. Uh, in fact, the entire character of Rivka came from a footnote I found, and I, I won't tell you what that happened is, but Rivka, um, I found a, a footnote, and I created the entire character to live that moment I found in a footnote at the very end of the book. So it's all, it all happened. Um, you were originally going to call the book State. Why did you change it? Um, I don't know. No. I, I just, I, I liked Isaac Speak, and um, the yeah. State felt, the State, I'm trying to avoid being polemical. I'm trying to avoid, I'm not trying to write a book about Israel. I'm trying to write a story about three characters who had a remarkable adventure in an incredible time and, and, and place in, in, in world history. And so the state was the original name and it felt a little polemic, felt a little pro-Israel. I'm not trying to be pro-anything. I'm trying to pick a, one of the great adventures, one of the great eruptions of politics and, 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 and will and force of the 20th century, and I tried to write, put characters there. One or two more questions and then I gotta turn it over to Joni. She does run things. Yes. I grew up in, in Brooklyn and um, knew a man who had a tattoo on his arm. No. Yeah. He could never. 
ever talk about, very much like your character here. And I, I, having, forgive me, not read the book yet, because I just bought it. <laughs> how do you, how do you, um, how do you explore characters who are reticent to talk about their pain? No, that's a great, that's a great question. Look, um, you can only have a character begin to be reticent. Um, if he does not, if that character does not testify in some way, then they have to live in a testifying fashion. Like Hugo, you can read this whole book and you can read the next one. Hugo never says squat about how he feels. Never. But Hugo acts in ways where you know exactly what he's doing. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer a wider question that you did not ask. I am exploring as a writer what I, 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 have, I have a particular style that I'm actually, I'm going to teach you. And this style is called, what I, it's, the word is lacuna. And a lacuna, for those of you who, who know brain science, it's a gap. It's something you go, I can't remember that. Well, that's a lacuna. When your brain won't come up with something. So it's a gap. What I'm doing in this book, and what I will do in, for all the books and what I've done in my plays, is, for instance, the, uh, uh, Joni mentioned earlier, I wrote a play about um, Aaron Burr. Well, Aaron Burr is not in the play. does not appear. Those of you who saw my play, Sam and Carol, the names of my parents, they are not in the play. Those are lacunas. So what I'm doing with this book is I will not tell you what my characters think or feel. I will not. But when Hugo puts his hand against that wall and he pushes and he says, I was meant to die here, you know what he feels. So I create this lacuna, this gap that you, the reader, will fill in. And by the time you're done reading it, you'll go, oh my God, I know these characters inside and out. Well, that's because you were the inside. I'm the out, you're the inside. So I'm creating a style with this book and with future books where I just refuse, I refuse to tell you what's going on inside my characters' heads and hearts. I will just show you what they do and you'll hear what they say and you'll see how they interact with other characters and you, the reader, will determine the motivations. And by the time you're done, you're going, know them intimately. Well, because you know yourself intimately. Um, that wasn't an answer to that question, but it, it uh, that, that's kind of what I'm doing. So when you have a character who's reticent, I think all my characters are reticent, um, but they're all active, right? Um, one more question, if not, we'll just get to the, yes, please, thank you. Uh, my late father was part of the Allied Forces that liberated Dachau mm -hmm. that first day, and he never talked about that experience. And thanks for putting flesh on that. Oh. You're welcome. I, I, my dad was at Pearl Harbor and was in the Pacific, and I wasn't smart enough growing up to ask him. That's why I run the Mighty Pen Project, because these beautiful men and women, I get to ask them, and they tell me, and I'm, I'm thrilled with that. So thank you for that comment. Mm -hmm. And again, um, um, my heart to each one of you, if we know each other, then you know I love you, and if I don't know you, you know um, you need to just buy a book. <laughs> 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 um, but thank you so much. And I really love the reading. I love the Q and A. I love wish we could just do this all night long. But we have the library until eight, and so I just want to make sure that you have time to um, have David inscribe or date your book if you would. Um, so I do. But wait, before we do that, before we do that, also sorry, I need to call up Black Lion. Salty, mystic, <laughs> spirit animal, David Aldridge. Some of you have a glass. If you don't have a glass, raise, raise your hand and raise the book. David's going to um, give us a toast. What an honor to be here. Uh, I can't tell you. Uh, I wanted to make sure I did this right. So, therefore, I wrote it out in the script. Because if I just go with a little extemporaneous speech, I'll be here all night. <laughs> and uh, we'll get nowhere. So, first of all, it is with the greatest love that uh, I join you tonight to honor our, our brother David and the launching of his book. Um, five years ago, I had the incredible good fortune to take a class at the VA War Memorial with the Mighty Pen Project. <clears throat> In those five years, I have watched and marveled 
and Professor David L. Robbins as he produced a huge body of work. He has written three plays, co-produced five other plays, written two novels, and is halfway through the third novel. It is the sequel to Isaac's Beacon, and I personally can't wait to read it. All that time, he has also taught at VCU and the Mighty Pen Project, along with classes for first responders, that is police, firemen, and EMT. He's also been a true mentor to hundreds of aspiring writers. He is a true Renaissance man in the 21st century, and he is a true friend. I've read a lot of books in my life, but Isaac's Beacon has profoundly touched my heart. It is a drama with a lots of intrigue and action, but it's also an unforgettable love story that makes the characters come to life. It made me want to rush off to Israel <laughs> so, I could, so I could see these places for myself, you know. Uh, Isaac's Beacon is supremely researched. What David does is he curates every word. And I'm not just talking about, well, that sentence could be restructured a little bit. I'm talking about every word. And so this is, above all, a historical novel. But it's also this driving narrative of lovable and believable characters that is destined to become a masterpiece of our time. May Isaac's Beacon become successful beyond your wildest dreams and expectations. And I say that with all my heart. Please join me in raising a toast to a great son of Richmond, <laughs> Professor David L. Robbins. To David and Isaac's Beacon, success. God bless you. Yes. Yes. Yes.